Hello. Excuse me while I get ready here. My name is BJ Paris. Welcome to Tapping Into His Treasures. How is everybody? I'm doing well. I hope you are too. There. Well, it was minus three when I woke up this morning. And this is middle afternoon and it's probably still in the single digits. And even though I'm in the house, I'm still freezing. So I have a vest on and a scarf. <laughs> and bear with me. As usual, I'm asking you to bear with me over something or other. So, yeah. Uh, I had uh, friends and relatives, uh, what do you call it, uh, Facebook messaging me from Florida. Oh, I hate to tell you, Auntie, but it's 75 degrees down here. And I swiftly wrote back. This only happens a couple of times a year, and I would take it over Florida's hurricanes and flooding and uh, crowds and excessive heat in the summer. I would take it any day of the week. So we've had that little war going back and forth. It's been fun. So I'm going to share a testimony right now, and then I'm just going to uh, touch on a subject for just a few minutes. And then I'm going to go back and read some more testimonies that I just came across, okay? Because uh, today I was, yesterday and today I was going through my file cabinets and I'm uh, taking out a lot of old receipts and old papers um, that need to be shredded. And I filled up a trash bag and uh, I came across some testimonies, not mine, but that I read years ago, and I remembered they blessed me so much long, long time ago, and I just wanted to share with them, them with the audience today. So it's going to be mostly a testimony day, except for that short little teaching we're going to have in just a little bit. So my testimony is, uh, I'm entitling it, God Always Does Us One Better. So a couple of nights ago, I don't want to lose, leave out anything important, so I'm going to put my cheaters on. A couple of nights ago, uh, I had the worst choking attack than I, that I've ever had in my entire life. I am a choker, and that's why I don't travel anymore, because if I ever had an incident on the highway um, down to see my relatives in Connecticut, uh, I don't know what would happen, but I just feel safe here in my apartment and just hanging around town. And uh, if I ever had to call... An ambulance they're right down the street you know just a half a minute away so but but a couple of nights ago uh, I was eating vinegar for the first time in a long time I usually just put a couple of drops and this time I I um, had quite a bit of it on a salad totally forgetting I just wasn't used to it so anyway right after I ate the salad I couldn't breathe and I thought I was dying and I've had terrible terrible for the last three years I must have had 40 or 50 choking attacks but this was beyond anything that I've had in the last few years even I could not breathe at all and I tried to hurry up and drink some water and and to, to breathe in like short breaths and finally my breath came back and I couldn't believe that I lived through it so anyway, that was a couple of nights ago, so uh, I guess it was yesterday that I, I wanted to say thank you, God, more than using just words. I wanted to fast something. So that very night, one of my favorite shows, two of my favorite shows were on, and it was, you guys know what it is, um, Pimple Popper, it's a very popular show, and, and then the new one this season, um, my feet are killing me. It's all about foot doctors. And the new seasons were starting on both shows, and I wanted so bad to see the first show of the new seasons. And I said, you know what, God, that's going to really bother me to give those up. But I want to I be bothered just to say thank you for saving my life. And it was killing me. <laughs> but anyway, this goes along with the title of the, my little testimony, God Always Does This One Better. I only have a few channels on my TV now, so uh, I wouldn't turn those cha that channel on. And I'm searching for something to watch, and there was nothing I was interested in. 
So just because I wasn't watching channel 62, the HGTV channel, and the, I think it's also the TLC channel, just because I wasn't fixed on that, uh, and I couldn't find anything else, I, I turned to um, the public public uh, broadcasting. And so it's channel 10 up here. And what was being aired was a main town, not far from where I live, well, maybe half an hour drive, Steersmont. Many, maybe some of you viewers have seen it. So I was watching it, and from watching it, I learned that one of my favorite authors Ben Ames Williams resided there and I never knew it so I was blown away and of course I, I learned some other very interesting things too from watching it so I gave up something for God as a thank you and God went one better and he did he did me one better and he blessed my socks off he blessed me and he never ceases to amaze me so I'll never forget that. That was just so special. I'm sure he does it for everybody. Sometimes we don't have our antennas up and we, we miss it when he does things for us, you know. So the thing we are going to talk about for just a few minutes is generational curses. And God's put this on my mind uh, for the last week or so. So people go about their busy lives often paying little or no attention to the subject of generational curses which are curses in different forms that parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents pass down to their grands and greats, grandchildren and great-grandchildren through being involved in demonic activity, um, living in negativity, and many other factors. And if your great-grandparents lived in constant constant stress, unforgiveness toward others, uh, had violent temperaments, uh, hatefulness, uh, etc. Those things can be passed down to generations in their families. If great-grandparents die early deaths, their ancestors may die early deaths as well. If grand and great-grands use the Ouija board and perform other means of satanic rituals, then their grand and great-grandchildren could be affected in various ways years and years and years and years later, such as being slow learners, not being able to concentrate in school, um, having symptoms of nervousness, and many more troubles. Really, there are just lists and lists of them. So these curses can be liberated. Did I say that right? Obliterated. I, I think I said it right. Obliterated. If you do what God teaches in Deuteronomy 4, which teaches, this quote, make these words known to your children and grandchildren. What happens when man doesn't speak God's words to his family? Psalm 44, 1 to 3 tells us that when men of old did not obey God's words, that he drove out the nations with his mighty hand. And then we also read in Genesis 3, 6, that Eve defiled God when he gave she and Adam specific orders not to eat from th that tree. And what happened? They were forced to leave the beautiful Garden of Eden. So it's for our own good that God warns us not to get involved with demonic activity as a source of pleasure. Some people think it's exciting, you know, to uh, do things like that. But God knows better than we do. Some say that generational curses are a fallacy. I'm saying, ask God to reveal to you in your spirit if they are, are a fallacy or not. Think about terrorists. Listen to this. Think about terrorists who think they are doing God a favor by killing Americans. You don't think that mindset was passed on from generation to generation? If you don't, think again. You know, the devil uses strategies with us. 
So we need to use strategies with him. We really, we need to stand up against him. We don't have to put on a spirit of fear after hearing this subject being spoken about. God gives Christians the power to break the spell of generational curses in our families through prayer, through calling on the blood of Jesus, and sometimes through fasting. There are many books written on the subject, and I suggest that if you've never read one, that you order one from the internet or in your bookstore. I don't want to give the, the names of any because I can't advertise on, on TV, okay? So, um, I was going to say, you know the pop, most popular books uh, bookseller on the internet. Just go there and you'll find them in no time. And now on to some testimonies. As I said, I, I was cleaning out the file cabinets and everything for two days and I came across these little pieces of paper and... Uh, many years ago, I can't remember how many, maybe 30, I think it was my oldest son and his wife used to get me um, a, a little desk calendar for every Christmas, along with something else, of course. And, uh, and each day of the week had one of these pages with the testimony written on. And, and, um, and the calendar itself was put out by a Jewish organization so all of the um, all of the testimonies are written by Jewish people, and I enjoy them so much. They like God used these for me in a very specific way all those years ago, and if I got something from them that still bless that still blesses me today to reread them, I'm hoping that you get the same excitement out of them that that I got and I'm still getting. Um, they added to my life, and I, I'm hoping that they add to your life, too. Oh, all the names have been changed, by the way. So the very first one blew me away. So that one I did type into bigger print over here. Okay, Solomon Schwartz felt blessed. Listen to it carefully now. Solomon Schwartz felt blessed. He and his wife, Minnie, were truly soulmates. Only one thing was missing from their life together. Children. In the twenty no, in the twelfth year of their marriage, the elderly patriarch of the Shorts family summoned Solomon into his study for a conference. The Torah, this is what the uh, the patriarch said. The Torah decrees that if your wife is barren for more than ten years, you must divorce her. The uncle stated. I've already spoken with Minnie, and she has agreed to give you a divorce. She loves you and wants the best for you. Things had been set in motion that could not be undone. Despite Solomon's protests, Minnie was committed wholeheartedly to the path of divorce. When he handed her the get, the word is G-E-T, get, which is a Jewish writ of divorce, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. That's what it sounds like. Jewish writ of divorce. Solomon was overcome with grief. He loved his wife. He said, love you always. He said, broken hearted. Eternally, she answered. That had to be awful. Two weeks later, she called him and told him that she was pregnant. After all those years, 12 years. We'll get married right away, he shouted. But the patriarch explained that because Solomon was a Kohen, in parentheses, from the caste of high priests who served in the temple. Maybe I'm saying it wrong, caste or caste. He was not allowed to marry a divorced woman. So this story is getting pretty complicated with that, right? Solomon was stunned, but all the scholars he consulted concurred. Solomon sought the counsel. Lubavitcher? Rebbe. Rebbe. I'm wondering if this Rebbe, capital R-E-B-B-E, -B -B -E, means the same as Rabbi. I don't know. But anyway, 
He sought the counsel of Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, a celebrated sage headquartered in Brooklyn. The Reb Rebbe studied Solomon for a moment and said, Go talk to your mother. Go talk to your mother. Solomon didn't know what the Rebbe meant, but maybe it was time for him to see his mother anyway. He told her everything. Son, his mother said, it is true that your father was a Cohen. So you assumed that you are one too, since it's passed down through the male line. But you're not a Cohen at all, and so you're free to remarry many. Son, Rabbi was right when he told you to talk to me. You see, you're adopted. Isn't that amazing? This is a true story. He was able to remarry his wife who was carrying his child. Amazing, amazing testimony. Okay, now we're going to go on to another little testimony. And this one's about... This was written a long time ago. It starts off saying about two years ago. So from where we are today, you and I, it's probably more like 32 years ago. Okay, so from the author. About two years ago, and this is, I didn't rewrite this, so it's tiny print, so I'm really going to have to squint when I, when I read this. About two years ago, my granddaughter Camille, a cute six-year-old, developed a sinus infection. The infection spread and Camille had to have brain surgery. All went well, except that a large portion of Camille's head was shaved. You know little girls. They are concerned about their appearance. So this smartest and prettiest of all granddaughters was unhappy because above the eyes and ears she looked like her grandfather instead of Goldilocks or Rapunzel. Consequently, she wore a cute beret pulled down low on her forehead. It sh I should have said forehead. I was taught in my the parochial school I went to when I was a girl uh, by a nun who who was uh, from, I believe, New Hampshire, and they didn't, and she taught us to say forehead rather than forehead. That's how they pronounced it up in, uh, I guess, Maine as well, Maine, New Hampshire, possibly for Vermont. So I've been saying that all of my years, forehead, <laughs> instead of forehead. So anyway, little girl Camille wore a cute beret pulled down low on her forehead. Two weeks after the operation, Camille and her mother ventured out for the first time. They went to the cosmetic counter of a beauty boutique. Her mother thought it might cheer up a little girl with a shaved head. Camille and her mom sat in this Chandeliered salon discussing powders and creams with the salesperson, a drop dead beautiful embodiment of what her products can do. Her hair especially was eye catching, long and thick, shining under the chandelier. Camille, eyes down, hat pulled low, began fidgeting. You can only imagine a little one. The counter lady registered at the scene. That's a cute little beret, she said to Camille. The child glanced knowingly at her mother. Well, I'm having a real bad hair day, she said. And then, to her mother's surprise, Camille pushed aside the hat to reveal the fresh scar and directly above her forehead, a patch of shaved scalp. The lady with the curls looked. Then, without blinking, she put her hand to her head and whipped off the rich, luxuriant wig that crowned her lovely face. She had no hair. Radiation, she explained, but I'm okay now. Then she bent over the counter and put her hand on the shoulder of the six-year-old. It'll grow back, honey, I promise. In the meantime, you look great in that cute beret. Isn't that a darling, wonderful, amazing testimony as well? You know what it just reminded me of? Not even before when I read it, but just this moment. It reminds me of a couple of stories that I've read recently about um, uh, 
the young ladies down in uh, Disney World in Florida, and I imagine in California as well, um, when they have these little children with their parents uh, in the park, the theme park, um, um, oh, some of them are autistic, and some of them, uh, maybe the walking around or the hot sun, it gets to them and, and they kind of lose it. And anyway, in the stories that I read, uh, couple of little boys were, or girls as well, were thrashing around on the ground, refusing to get up and that type of thing, okay? Maybe like having a tantrum. And in these scenarios, um, not really scenario, well, I guess you would call them a scenario, see? Um, so I think it was like Snow White, the young lady dressed up as Snow White with her, uh, gown that went all the way to the ground, puffy, with the little white apron on the gown. And uh, in one instance, she went to the little boy on the ground, thrashing, right down on the ground, sat on the ground, and lay on the ground right next to him and identified with him. And he responded to her instantly. She put him, her arm around him and uh, spoke lovingly to him. Isn't that beautiful? So it kind of reminded me about the little girl Camille's, uh, the lady who had the long, luxurious hair from the cosmetics uh, counter. Um, isn't it wonderful when people could do something like that? That's the grace of God. It's a, a heart of gold, a heart of compassion, a heart of empathy. Okay, I think we have time for one or two more. Yeah, okay, let's see. The next one is Camille. Okay, here it is, right here. Um, no one knew that she had a, no one knew that she had a weak heart. That's the first sentence of the third testament here. Her circumstances were dire, or she lived it in great poverty. When she gave birth to her first son, her heart faltered. The second time around, a son again. She could barely breathe. She was incapable of handling a second child. Somehow the decision was made to give him up for adoption, but she was told that her baby was dead. And that's not an uncommon practice back along, not at all. I've, I've, I've watched many stories, um, videos and movies about uh, young pregnant mothers who, who t were told that their babies were dead. And the doctors at the time, years and years ago, would make money off selling them, selling the babies. Okay, let's go on. The, she was told the baby was dead. Mario Lucier, the first son, had been told only three things about his younger brother. He was born on February 14th, his name was Dino, and he had died at birth. In 1978, the young mother died never knowing that her second son was alive and well, adopted into a loving family and renamed Robert. Both sons had inherited their mother's weak heart. When Mario Lucier, the first son, was dying of cardiac failure, he was sent to Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal, where he underwent a successful heart transplant. Five years later, another young man was on the same floor of the same hospital about to undergo the same procedure. Simone Saroy, a nurse, met the new patient, whose name was Robert, and blinked. After interviewing him, she impulsively phoned Mario Lucier. I've just seen your double, she said. I hope you're following. That's the first guy who had the transplant five years prior. I've just seen your double, she said. Mario told her that it was impossible. Simone checked the hospital records and learned that Robert's birth date was February 14th. She also discovered that the men's tissue samples were identical. This proved that they were brothers. After surgery and recovery, the secret was disclosed. Robert shook his head in disbelief. The first meeting was mo m monumentous, 
for both men. We hugged and we cried, Mario said. Simone Saroy told reporters that it was a fluke that Robert had ended up in her ward. She says, something just clicked when I saw him. Well, they can call it a fluke, but I call it God. Because God does these things for us every day of the week, every day of the year. Someplace in the world, he does this stuff for us. Not a fluke, not a coincidence, not a fluke. I promise you. So I hope you enjoyed that one. I have one more, but I'll have to save it for another time, okay? Um, let's see. Yeah. We better say the Lord's Prayer and our, uh, do uh, our prayers for the viewers and sign off, okay? If you bow with me. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And Father, I bring before you this entire audience in all the, all the New England states. Mothers and dads and grandmoms and grandpas and great-grandmoms and great-grandpas and um, children and teenagers and adult children, uh, those on college campuses with everything going on in those places today. Father, put a hedge of protection around them. Um, those that are caregivers and taking care of elderly parents, and we all know they've got to be exhausted, uh, especially where there's Alzheimer's and dementia involved, Father. Bless these caregivers, Father. Bless them. Please bless them and strengthen them physically and emotionally, Father. In Jesus' name we ask. And for grandchildren and uh, great-grandchildren, um, let us all be faithful to pass on the gospel and the Bible, uh, all the things that we were, uh, our attention was called to today as far as uh, Deuteronomy and Genesis and the things that we share today. All these things, if we're not the ones to do it, to impart all these things to our children, who is going to do it? We have to do it. Let us be faithful. Help us to be faithful in doing these things, Lord. Uh, let's see. And those in hospitals those in prisons, uh, our law enforcers, Father, the military, with so much going on overseas, the military. Father, just intervene in all these, all these uh, situations, we pray. Oh, God, just fill us, Lord. Fill us with empathy for people who need God. Lord, help. Be the helper that you promised that you would be, and we know you are help in Jesus name so um, God bless you I don't want to forget anything thanks most of all thanks for watching and then next God bless you God bless yours yours meaning your family everybody, all your loving family and your relatives um, God keep you and God keep all of them too and until next time bye bye for now and don't forget I love you guys, and I'm praying for you during the week. Every day with intercessory prayers at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, so you're being prayed for. God bless. Bye-bye.